Hello, everyone. Okay, sorry about that. We had a bit of an echo here. Hello, everyone, again, and welcome to another episode of Open Observability Talks. I'm your host, Totan Horvitz, and here at Open Observability Talks, we talk about anything DevOps, observability, and open source. Uh, this is actually the closing episode of 2022, and I just got uh, the end-of-year podcast statistics from Spotify, so I'm glad to share that we have uh, listeners from over 40 uh, countries. Uh, with around 270% increase in followers and uh, several hundred listeners ranked us uh, in the top uh, 10 podcasts. So first of all, thank you uh, so much for joining me on the show and for following us and giving us high ranking. Uh, the show is available on all the popular podcast apps, uh, Apple, Spotify, Google, and more, uh, as well as on YouTube. So if you are not yet a follower, go ahead and uh, join us. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Logs.io, the cloud-native observability platform. Logs.io takes the best of read open source projects such as Prometheus, OpenSearch, uh, and Jaeger, and offers them as a unified observability platform built for scale. For those joining the live stream or on, on YouTube or Twitch, uh, feel free to share questions and comments on the chat. We'd be more than happy to uh, take them in uh, into the uh, fireside chat. And with that, let's move on to today's episode. When I was at KubeCon in Detroit, I was amazed by how many updates were in the Prometheus and the Prometheus ecosystem. And then a few weeks later at uh, PromCon in Germany. So I decided to ask uh, Julien Pivotto to uh, join me to discuss all these updates. Uh, Julien is a maintainer of uh, Prometheus. He's also a co-founder of uh, Oli, a company that provides support for uh, open source observability tools such as Prometheus, Thanos, and Grafana. And he's definitely the authoritative source for all things uh, Prometheus. So let me bring, invite Julian uh, into the uh, live stream. Hey, Julian. Hello, hello. Uh, glad to have you uh, here on the uh, on the show finally. Yes, yes. It's, uh, it's glad to be here for the very last of uh, this year. <laughs> yeah, perfect ending for the year. Uh, as an anecdote, uh, two years back we had uh, Julius Volz, uh, Julius here on the uh, on the show uh, back then, also giving uh, an overview. But so much has changed that, uh, as I told you also before, we can just treat it as a, as a clean slate and just uh, share with everyone the latest and greatest. Um, so maybe uh, if you can share a bit about uh, you and your background, so the audience uh, can know a bit more about uh, about your authoritative source. Yes, yeah, so I have been working since 2011, and uh, I have been always focused on open source in my work because that's the way I, I like the, the software I'm using. And I have been contributing to several open source software. Uh, I have also been involved in the automation world with uh, tools like Puppet and Foreman. And uh, since 2017, I have also shifted towards uh, Prometheus and monitoring. I already did some monitoring before, but I really started with Prometheus when I see the potential. And from 2017 to 2019, I was a contributor to Prometheus. And I joined the Prometheus team in 2020 to become the Prometheus server maintainer in 2021. And now that's where I'm working on. So I'm working most of my time on Prometheus. Uh, supporting customers uh, and developing the software further. And also I'm involved in the community of uh, several exporters. So it's a really fun project to be in and that's where I am now uh, in my career, so. Amazing. And uh, actually this is also a very special time for a uh, Prometheus project. Uh, it's, a, it's a 10 year old project. In fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, and. and in uh, November 2022, we celebrated 10 years to the uh, first commit in the Prometheus repo. So uh, that's, that's yes. a significant uh, milestone. The project itself is still a bit older than that, but you get to, to select a date. And uh, that's the, the 
actual date that we have because the other days are lost in time. So yeah, we celebrate 10 years since the first Comet of Prometheus, even if the world only knows Prometheus is since 2015. Uh, but yeah, Prometheus is uh, quite uh, old and mature project now. Uh, as you uh, as you know, it's the second project in the CNCF, uh, which is also a great achievement. And by coincidence, uh, it's also a Greek god, just like Kubernetes is a Greek word. So <laughs> we are both ten letter projects, uh, and they're both the first project in the CNCF. So it's quite nice to see uh, all of the history happening. Yeah. It's amazing. So, so maybe before uh, diving into the uh, latest updates, let's zoom uh, out a bit and, and look at Prometheus as a project. We don't need to do the historical review, but maybe uh, as, as you perceive it, what's the uh, the current uh, let's say mission statement, where the project is heading in the uh, in the macro, like in the major major uh, uh, items that uh, that you see uh, the project heading to and evolving. So Prometheus is a monitoring solution. It has always been, and it will continue to be the monitoring solution, which means that when we have to make trade-offs, we trade-offs, we all, always choose the monitoring way, uh, and we want it to be like that. I also want the project to continue to be very simple to use, which means that, uh, for example, when I'm giving a training about Prometheus, the same training should work over the years because I want the basics to always work the same. And that's very important that when we add complexity, we can still have newcomers coming and using the project uh, quite easily. And that's a key point of point is that it is really easy to set up. Uh, you just need to start the binary, you have your server, and then you configure it the way you want. Now, in the way that uh, it is evolving now, we are actually having a lot of uh, users from many different areas. So we used to be monitoring for infrastructure. And now we see that we are monitoring a lot of different things because we just take a lot of data and we enable you to query it the best way that you want. So we have seen people doing wind turbines. We have seen people doing uh, their own monitoring like uh, electricity consumption and everything around that. So we are really um, versatile in what we can offer and what people are doing with the project, which is also really nice because as an open source project, you should be just free to use it in the way you want. If you want to use it in production, in your kitchen, in your basement, anywhere you want, you can run Prometheus. Uh, it's available for everyone for every purpose. What we are also seeing in the future is that uh, we are also evolving with the community and the world around us. Like uh, in the last Dev Summit, we have also decided that we would also move towards uh, ingesting an open telemetry matrix natively. So we, it's not like we are evolving in our own corridor without looking at what's going on around us, but we want to continue to stay relevant and to stay a uh, best in class monitoring solution. Yeah, it's funny when I saw uh, the update on uh, adding the um, the uh, trigonometrical functions that just showed me how uh, how different use cases that we might have not imagined originally for Prometheus that are less common maybe on the uh, IT infrastructure, but are, are much more common in other use cases. Just to show you uh, that you get some requests for uh, for features that just uh, expose all different domain of uh, use cases. Um, so I think um, one of the most, most uh, impressive things for me in uh, Prometheus as an open source project and uh, maybe even a, a de facto standard for in many cases, in many essences, uh, is the rich ecosystem. The fact that uh, many um, frameworks, many tools today provide out of the box, uh, um, expose their, their metrics in this format and they uh, provide all sorts of uh, integrations. That's, I think, uh, the charm because essentially whatever you have in your stack, if you uh, drop Prometheus, it's uh, very easy to start uh, collecting metrics. So uh, let, let's start. I think it's a good point maybe to start covering <clears throat> where we stand with uh, with uh, with Prometheus and the updates there. Can you share with us maybe about uh, the service discovery 
elements uh, that have been added and where where you're heading uh, in this respect yes so uh, the first point that we had it regarding scraping and service query was an agent board it's not so more uh, quite recent it was added i think two years ago but it enables you if you only want to use prometheus to integrate with project like uh, thanos cortex mimir uh, and you, you just want the remote right you can do it and you don't need the local time series database which means that your prometheus server will use a lot less uh, uh, a few, only a percentage of the RAM on the disk space and on the resources that it would need otherwise. So um, we listen to the users. They say, okay, we have a global solution. We have a provider that will just ingest a pretty Prometheus data. And uh, we, we just agree that, okay, let's do something upstream so that you can continue using Prometheus with a lower footprint. Uh, you have to do some trade-off, but you can just, uh, we can lower the, trend, the footprint of Prometheus. If you need to run it only on one node, or if you need to uh, just run it at the edge of your cluster, you can just do it with the agent mode. So that that's for the, uh, the, the overall improvement that you have done of service discovery. So we have a completely new mode of operating Prometheus. Then regarding the ecosystem, um, we have added a lot of service discoveries. The last one, is the uh, OVH cloud service discovery. We also had a lot of different cloud providers coming to us wanting to watch support for their I, On the top of my head, uh, Linode, Volter uh, joined the, the project to integrate their, their monitoring solution, uh, their uh, service discovery into Prometheus. We are working with Oracle as next one, Oracle Cloud. And moreover, um, when discussing with the community and when looking, okay, what are people using as sidecar for Prometheus that we could integrate upstream, I came over Netbox. Netbox, which is in Python, and it was not easy for them to have co binaries to build uh, inside Prometheus because there is no client really. So, and it's not as Prometheus the goal that we maintain a client for a netbox. And so instead we go the other way around and we say, okay, uh, we will have an HTTP service query. It will be generic and you we can just query any HTTP endpoint and get the targets out of this, those endpoints. Before that, we had only the file service discovery. So you needed to write a file on the Prometheus server, which is not super handy. And uh, that's why we added that new HTTP service discovery. And that's, a very important point when I am trying to drive Prometheus to one is that if you are using sidecars next to your Prometheus server, let's look together, do we still need that sidecar or can we integrate upstream? As the project is growing, we want to meet users' need. We need to remove the barrier to use Prometheus. Um, and really like uh, we want to work better for you, work better for the users. So we are really like working with the community to integrate all those different use cases directly in Prometheus. We want to reduce the sidecars. We really want to make it easier to use Prometheus. And it's also always better when you run a monitoring solution to have less moving pieces, you know, uh, because then if you have a sidecar, you need to monitor it, you need to do anything about it. So just like we are integrating a lot of things in, uh, in Prometheus to make it easy for you to, to use it. I think that, that point that you said is also very important, the emphasis of the project on the productization and the ability to make it as easy, as, as friendly as possible for integration in, in, IT, in IT environments uh, with all the constraints. I think one of the other examples that it relates to uh, the rich suite of uh, uh, service discovery uh, options available is that uh, there's, there's a lot of them, but then again, uh, obviously, for a specific environment, you don't need all of them. And then uh, the new plugin system uh, lets you compile Prometheus without uh, any unnecessary uh, service discovery uh, plugin. So you can only compile it to the size that is relevant for you and keep it clean. Uh, maybe you want to say a word about uh, this new uh, plugin system? Yes. Yeah, so back in 2021, I think, or 2020, well, a user came in and said, okay, I want to help on one issue in Prometheus, which is instead of the config package of Prometheus, depending on all the service coveries, I want the service coveries to depend on config and to register themselves. And that enables us now to, when we add a new service covery, 
uh, you can decide to opt in or opt out of the service query when you compile Prometheus. It is also possible to use an out of three service query. So if you really want to use a service query in Prometheus in your way and you want to not to share it publicly or we cannot integrate it upstream, you can also just compile your own plugin and seamlessly integrate into Prometheus. So we have a plugin system at build time that enables you to uh, build in or out uh, service discovery plugins. So uh, some of the tests have shown that if you if you only pick one or two service coverage, you can gain up to 60% of your disk usage. Wow, that's amazing. That, that's that's really impressive. Um, you know, we, we ran into the uh, details of the service discovery, but maybe we should take a, just a, a quick uh, introductory word for those who are not familiar with the system. Essentially, service discovery being the way that Prometheus discovers its targets or the components in the architecture for scraping or for pulling the metrics. Uh, can you give us just a quick uh, word about the context of uh, service discovery mechanism? Yeah, so service discovery actually it's a big selling point for Prometheus because uh, when you have a monitoring solution, if it is not aligned with what you with your infrastructure, you get a lot of false alarms or you don't see some services. And service discovery means that Prometheus can automatically connect to the source of truth in your infrastructure to know exactly okay what is in the infrastructure, what should be there, what should I monitor, and when you will unregister or register new services the monitoring will be adjusted. So uh, for example, we natively connect to Kubernetes, to console, to a lot of uh, different uh, um, cloud providers, to Docker. So we can talk to a lot of different sources that actually know your infrastructure. And so you only need to change, to change those sources and directly the new uh, targets will be scraped by Prometheus. And Prometheus came out of the box with a lot of different service coverage, and uh, we added more than 10 in the in the last two years, I think. So it's really growing a lot. We see a lot of demand, and it's, it's really fun to manage and to personally work with all those cloud providers to test everything out so that when you come to Prometheus, we already have support for your cloud provider. And on top of that, we not only do we fetch the targets, do we decide which targets we can monitor for you, but you also have the flexibility to add some labels to your targets. So if you monitor virtual machines, you can have a label with the data center they are in. You can have a label with uh, anything you want, basically. Uh, if you have some tax applied to your virtual machines, like many cloud providers in ML, you can select the one you want to monitor based on the tax. So we really have offer a lot of flexibility in the way that you fetch your target and that Prometheus knows, okay, I know I need to monitor that target. Yeah, that's amazing. And actually one of the uh, extra flexibility that uh, you released recently in the, in the project is the ability to even have a scraping interval being adjusted because maybe not the same interval fits all of the types. So we can actually have a, a, an interval uh, defined per specific labels, right? Yes, yeah, so what's important is that we want to, to make it easy for you to decide how you want to monitor each target. And uh, we also don't want you to do 10 different API calls to your cloud provider. So we are uh, bringing more capabilities to do a feature called relabeling, which means that based on a set of initial information you get from the cloud provider or for your um, orchestration layer, you can decide, okay, that target I want to monitor in a certain amount of time. So now you can monitor, you can change the script interval and the script um, and the script timeout for each target individually. That's amazing. So, uh, and, and you mentioned just before uh, about the agent mode, I want to say a word for, for audience is less familiar. So essentially, uh, uh, since Prometheus is, is so, has so many facets to it and so many capabilities, the the so the auto discovery the scraping capabilities we just talked about and then again also the uh, the time series database that we're going to talk about and others so uh, the agent mode is sort of a lightweight uh, version or mode for Prometheus that takes up away the the database piece which is obviously very heavyweight uh, in case there is a, a, a backend a database where the Tados, Mimir, uh, Cortex, or, or any other that is Prometheus compatible, so that they need uh, the Prometheus piece solely for the 
uh, scraping for the fetching of the of the metrics. That's the agent mode that you mentioned that was released uh, one or two years ago and is uh, gaining a lot of popularity for this type of architectures, right? Yes. Great. Yes, so, uh, and people are just using a lot of different backends to to store the metrics that from this is fetching. It's really amazing to see all of these backends uh, working together to to get the best out of the the Prometheus protocol. Actually, that that's why I think the the title of Prometheus ecosystem updates is is adequate because a lot of the uh, innovation actually or or the new stuff happened also and the surrounding peripheral uh, elements uh, around Prometheus, which is also enabled by Prometheus's capabilities for remote write, remote read, and, and other uh, APIs that allow for this integration. So I think it's it's uh, definitely a, a point of strength for the project. Um, and, and if we talked about, we mentioned the uh, time series database. So uh, maybe first, if you want to say a word about what, what it means, uh, the time series database, and, and specifically what Prometheus offers, and then we, we can uh, go to discuss some, some new stuff that was added there. Yes, so Prometheus stores this data in a time series database. So it is basically blocks of data written every uh, couple of hours. And those blocks are basically immutable. And then we compact them together to optimize the displays and, uh, and the query time and that kind of things. So uh, this is all managed by Prometheus. You don't have to maintain anything. The only input that input that you have is I want to keep that amount of data for that much time and then Prometheus will just deal with that all on its own. So it's a database you can only query with Prometheus or uh, and yeah it's it's very like um, tail or made for Prometheus. It's built on the it's built on top of the Korea uh, paper from Facebook. So it's very efficient at compacting the data and uh, and encoding the data in a very efficient way. And we are still looking into ways to improve that uh, to improve that further. So it should still improve in the future the way that we uh, create those blocks to make them smaller and easier to to query. And, and one of the nice things that you added recently is the uh, ability to backfill data to do out of order ingestion in case we need to uh, fill in some some gaps of, of information, right? Yes, so there are many use cases. Uh, so uh, the easy way to do that is by using the remote write protocol, which you can see basically, uh, you can see that as a replication protocol for Prometheus, basically. It is the way that Prometheus will write to Thanos, to Mimir, but you can see that just as a replication protocol. If you use it between two Prometheus servers, they will just replicate the data. We have added uh, backfilling data, which means that if you want to fill in data from the past, you can do it with, uh, with the TSDB now, and then the data will be nicely put into Prometheus blocks later on and can be queried. So this is still very early, uh, but it brings new use cases or new migration paths if you move from another uh, monitoring solution, you could use that to backfill some of your data and generate Prometheus native lock in, in a different way. So uh, this is a nice feature to have, which means that you can start monitoring and then maybe fill data from the past more easily. Uh, the, previously, you had to create blocks with some uh, adequate tools and put them in the TSDB. Now we are bringing that directly to the API. We are also adding next to that backfilling uh, support for native histograms. Basically. Uh, it means that you can now calculate your, your percentiles more easily with more accuracy, uh, which means that you don't need to define in advance the buckets that you want. So an histogram basically is you, you, you have uh, buckets and you will see, okay, I have my, one of my query which is coming. It is taking nine seconds, so I'll put it in the in the bucket nine, eight, six, and zero, uh, up to zero second. And then you can say, okay, uh, how did I reply to ninety nine point five percent of my request? And then you get a number. And the new histograms uh, enables you to have very uh, precise number relative to the old way of Instagram we are working. And it's really nice to see that improvement coming and that Prometheus TSDB can store more complex types than just uh, metrics, which is also more efficient because 
Um, we don't need to repeat all the labels 10 times in the time series database. Now we just have an object coming on and it's a lot easier to see. And it's really important, not for uh, when you want to calculate SLOs, when you want to uh, really know what's going on, you it is always better to have the closest estimation to the result if that's available. And it comes more or less fluently to Prometheus now. Uh, you need to use the correct client library and then the rest will just work automatically. There is also some adjustment to the query that you make, but uh, at the end of the day, this should work pretty well for uh, most of the users. So I really recommend you to have a look at those native histograms because they will really help uh, you and uh, avoid things like uh, calculating averages, that kind of things, because they will they will become a lot more practical than just trying to guess your latency. You can get the correct number now. Can you maybe just for for those who are not familiar, what like what what did we have so far, and uh, so to to make clear what's the improvement here for those who are not familiar. Yeah, so currently when you define uh, an hist um, histogram in Prometheus, you need to say, okay, I want the bucket and then you need to name the bucket. So like I want the bucket at one second, two seconds, four seconds, a second. So you need to know upfront what's going on. And the thing is that when you have an actual incident, well, who knows the bucket that you would have needed to put in, right? Yeah. Because uh, some incidents are clearly out of what you could expect and then the only thing your alert will tell you is that, oh, the requests take more than 10 seconds, but you don't really know like if they are blocked forever or if they are 30, 11 seconds. So it's really important that we remove that uh, that kind of uh, prerequisite that you need to define your buckets up front because also like uh, when you uh, respond pretty fast, you don't need that 10 second bucket, right? So those native histograms, they make a big change regarding that one. Uh, and it's really a great added value for everyone in the community to just have better data. And that's the key point here is that we want you to have better data. And uh, it's, it's pretty early on with the uh, native histograms, right? In terms of the maturity, do you want to say where it stands and what's the timeline for releasing that? So they are now an experimental feature, uh, but a, um, there are multiple people working on them full time, well, or at least a last a check of the time. It was out in the latest Prometheus release 2.40.0, and uh, there have been quite a few bug fixes on that release. So now we are at 2.40.7. <laughs> so, uh, and a couple of the releases fixes some bugs with the native histogram. So they are already used by people that notice some issues. So it's really nice to see that the community is already engaging with them. Uh, I don't know when it will be uh, ready available for everyone, but we are working on that definitively. Sounds good. Uh, and another thing that I, I found very, very exciting is the, to the topic of exemplars. Uh, maybe just for our listeners, uh, the ability to, uh, we talk about observability a lot here in the, uh, uh, in the uh, podcast and uh, a lot of the aspects of observability go beyond just monitoring by the ability to correlate the monitoring and the metrics with additional uh, types of telemetry to get a broader picture and uh, exemplars being a, the tool to actually correlate from the metric to uh, respective exemplars or, or samples, uh, shall we say, of, of let's say traces or others. Uh, would you like to say a word about uh, the what we're aiming to achieve with Prometheus and where we're starting with this feature? Yeah, so exemplar basically when you uh, have uh, when you will see with your histogram that you have a spike in your response time, you have a check exemplars and that you can enable on the Prometheus UI or on the Grafana UI, and then you can see okay at that moment uh, I have an example of a request that took a long time, and then when you click on it, you are proud back to Jaeger, for example, that will tell you, okay, this is the full trace of a query that took a long time. And then you can start seeing, okay, uh, where did the query took, uh, why did the query took so long? And then you can actually see, okay, it was in this piece of the span and then you can really investigate directly. So you, you don't need to jump from one tool to another and trying to guess because you have the correct exemplar attached to the, to the metrics with the correct timestamp and the correct value. Yeah, uh, so that's great. And uh, obviously we see that not just with uh, Prometheus, we see that also with uh, open telemetry that uh, adopts it as part of the specification and others. I think this is an essential 
a paradigm for for getting these uh, signals together enabling the correlation and the baggage by the way we should say it's it's essentially a, an identifier it uh, the example of a trace id is a classic example but it doesn't necessarily have to be a trace id right it doesn't have to be a trace id it's very often used as a trace id and there are also some technical limitation with the number of Characters allowed, but basically, yes, you have an identifier, you have a type stamp, and you have a value. So essentially, I can also use that to correlate to sample logs, for instance, right, or or other other types of uh, telemetry or or reference data. You could use that, but I think there is a one hundred and twenty eight bytes limit on the exemplars. No, I mean ID that will help me. Oh uh, yes, correlate. yes. Not, yes. not the raw log, but uh, again, using ID based uh, to jump to the relevant. Uh, sample logs but uh yes yeah. but uh, ideally uh based uh when you look at the uh open tracing uh, when at the lock at the the trace you should also get the logs embedded into the trace for that specific uh span that's true if, if we follow the the best practices of uh embedding the uh, contextual logs within the spans many organizations unfortunately are not there yet so uh so yeah that, that's an important point to say uh, the, the next uh, part that I would like to talk about is the PromQL. This is the query language that Prometheus uh, uh, developed uh, natively. And actually, back in the day, it was pretty uh, novel because everyone was used to uh, Graphite at the time or similar that used a hierarchy model, hierarchical model. And uh, PromQL came with a labeling system that was much more uh, flexible, uh, better fit for high cardinality metrics, for uh, doing slicing and dicing, uh, ad hoc uh, queries by different dimensions. So um, could you give us a bit of the background on PromQL and uh, where we're heading, uh, where we're standing with, the, uh, with this uh, aspect? Yeah, so PromQL basically, well, you have the Prometheus data model, as you have said, which is uh, matrix, all have labels, which are key values. And then you need something to query the data that you have. And PromQL uh, is really simple uh, to start with. So you don't need to know a lot to start getting your, the rate of HTTP request, for example. It is quite uh, easy. It gets sometimes to get to know about the details when you want to be very specific, which is why we have some tools to help you, which we speak about just uh, after this. But uh, the idea is that it is a powerful query language to just get your data out of your server and not just like the raw data that you can do relevant calculation that you can extract really like what is important to, to you and your infrastructure. And those labels are also fully integrated to the PromQL in the way that PromQL is working. So you can indeed select based on some data centers, based on some nodes, and also do the aggregation. Like I want to do the HTTP request per data center. This is all possible in PromQL. What is changing in PromQL in the future, and now we in the future, is that we adapt to new use cases. So we have new functions used by um, the scientific community, for example, with function like the sign function, which gives you one or minus one or zero, depending on the sign of your of your data. We have trigonometric function, as we have discussed. So we are bringing new function to Prometheus that we think are useful for uh, the users. And it's really important to us to continue expanding the language without also adding everything that's possible, of course, because we still want to be able to know and to support the users. And uh, so it's not like we will add it, uh, hundreds of functions, but we really try to keep on with the usage that people are doing with Prometheus and trying to, in to integrate what is useful for the users. And that's, I think, something that is very prominent in the way that the project has been running, that is very driven by the community and the actual use cases and, and what's being put to use. Even things that, as you said, you and I maybe have not have anticipated in advance, but when you see again and again, for example, the trigonometry, then yes, there is a demand. There are valid use cases that apparently are, are more frequent that, uh, and popular that, uh, than we uh, assumed. And uh, the community serves that. That's, uh, I think that's amazing. 
Uh, do you want to say a word, by the way, about the uh, the ability, the support for uh, offsets? Uh, maybe uh, about in the yes. Language? So uh, we also had uh, added support for uh, negative offsets. So offset means that when you will select your data, you can offset the selection by uh, an amount of time. And now we have added support for negative offset. It's not really a big thing, but uh, it's the kind of small quality of life improvements that we make <laughs> over the years. That's like uh, when you when you start using Prometheus and you you see something you want to try to try it out and it doesn't work, it's quite frustrating. So we also try to bring those small improvements to the community. The next change is the at modifier, which means that uh, you can have more complex queries. So if you want to uh, to, for example, graph the top five CPU application that have a high CPU usage right, right now over time. You can use more complex queries to do those, those kind of things using the add modifier. So you can select, uh, you can do a selection of metrics based on a calculation that you would do at the end of your current query. So it's really like a, a lot of different improvement that we are doing to the language. That uh, is completely optional, so you don't have to use them. You can still do your perfectly simple rate function if you want. But we are also present for the power users that need more advanced queries and that don't want to rely on features of, for example, Grafana uh, to draw their own features. So the add modifier was possible uh, to do in combination with some uh, complex things on Grafana side, but now we also have the same capabilities directly in your PromQL function. So it's uh, in one place. And if you use the Prometheus console, Grafana, or another tool, you will still be able to run the same function and it will give you the correct answer. Yeah, sounds good. And uh, uh, we, we started mentioning the ecosystem around like Grafana and others. I think one very important uh, recent update in the Prometheus ecosystem is the contribution of PromLens uh, to the Prometheus uh, project. Uh, we talked about uh, the power of PromQL, but sometimes uh, it could be a bit complex to build complex queries uh, just textually and uh, having some visual aid and UI could be significantly uh, beneficial. And that was the project PromLens that uh, uh, Julius Volz from PromLabs uh, developed for uh, for quite some time. And now it's been contributed, open sourced and contributed to uh, uh, to the Prometheus as a native citizen of Prometheus by uh, Julius Volz, PromLabs, and, and also Chronosphere. So first of all, uh, kudos for them for, for this very uh, significant contribution. Uh, maybe you can help us uh, with uh, some information about this. Yes, so PromLens is a query builder from Windows, a query explainer. So basically, you type your Prometheus query and it will run it and explain you what it is doing. Uh, one of the more, uh, one of the nice use cases of PromLens and a lot of people that are using Prometheus have got that issue sometimes is that you have a query and it does not return anything. If it is a complex query, uh, it's not always easy to figure out why it's not returning anything, and that's where PromLens can help you because when you will type your query, it will actually not run your query at once, but it will run all the different parts of the query and tell you, okay, at that step of the query, I still have 20 results. When I compare to that other things, oh, now I have zero result as the output. So you can easily find which part of the query is generating output and at which point the output is dropped. So that's the main use case for PromLens. It's really understanding, okay, why don't I have anything outside of my query? And I think it's kind of a game changer in the way that you can work with from queries that you don't understand or that are more complex because directly you see, okay, I have a zero there. I know that's where I have to look at. So what's on one side, what's on the other side, what's, what doesn't match. So it's really nice to see that coming upstream uh, on uh, Prometheus. And also some part of PromLens will probably be directly available inside Prometheus. So. Uh, uh, not everything, for example, in problems, you can share your queries, you can um, do a lot of things, but the main paths uh, to debug your PromQL queries are probably coming uh, in the following months inside the Prometheus server. Nice. That's uh, that's important. And, and this, so it, it will be available in terms of the UI as part of the Prometheus UI? Yes. Excellent. So uh, that's uh, actually, we haven't talked about Prometheus UI itself. So 
everyone knows Prometheus from this uh, infrastructure elements for scraping for time series database, but Prometheus does, uh, does offer a UI. Many uh, use uh, Grafana and others, but it is important that I think there are uh, quite a, a good few changes that uh, were made uh, and, uh, and enhancements, uh, whether the, the, the make it friendlier like a dark mode, but even more something more, more significant like uh, auto completion uh, of the of the PromQL syntax and others. So, uh, do you want to tell us maybe a bit about uh, people things that people may, might not be aware of that are available uh, on the Prom and the Prometheus UI? Yeah, so the Prometheus UI uh, has seen a lot of changes. So we basically changed the complete UI in the last few years to go to a React UI based uh, UI. And what uh, what is really important is that now we are working towards the performance of the UI. Like uh, for example, the targets page now is uh, not loading all in one, but we are loading every job separately uh, for each other because some people are using Prometheus with crazy numbers. Like uh, they they run Prometheus with thousand of uh, of targets and we want to provide them uh, with a fluent way of using the UI. The new UI also uh, brings direct support for uh, completion of PromQL queries based on the metric that you have in your community server. So you can type, start your query and it, it will give you suggestions or complete your metrics. So it's really nice to see that uh, you are really helped a lot when you write a query in Prometheus now. We have also seen some third party using the same library that we have been put together to do the auto completion because PromCall is supported also by some cloud provider tools now. So it's really nice to see that used more and more and that it's becoming easier to write uh, PromQL queries. Uh, we also have the dark mode, as you, as you mentioned, which is really, well, it's an interesting story, actually. So, yeah, okay, there is a dark mode button, but uh, it was contributed by the community, so not by someone from the Prometheus team. And it's a kind of query when you see the first time, you're like, yeah, this will be too much work. It will never, like, uh, be finished or it will never start. And then the community is working together with the Prometheus team. And at the end, it's the kind of feature that happens. Even if at the beginning you really wonder, like, will there be someone to maintain that? Because it's quite, uh, you think it's easy, but it's actually quite difficult to, to get everything uh, correctly. So it's really nice from the community to have support for that kind of features, uh, because, you know, Prometheus uh, is still a very small project when you compare it, for example, to Kubernetes, because we have a much more, uh, lower focus focus on yeah. monitoring only and we try not to go in uh, to do in every direction so it's really a small project when you look at the big open source project out there uh, so yeah it's really nice to see that the community is mature enough to produce that kind of output and uh we mentioned before we mentioned grafana a few times grafana is uh, i think maybe the most popular uh uh, visualization front-end tool for uh, for Prometheus. It's uh, not part of the CNCF stack. It's uh, provided by Grafana Labs uh, as an uh, as an AGPA licensed uh, uh, open source. Um, and I know that many use that, but uh, but on the other hand, maybe uh, people did uh, wonder what uh, is going to be uh, the CNCF's native um, uh, native solution for that. So do you want to help us understand where? Uh, things stand and where we're heading, like the Persis project and, and others? Yeah, so basically, um, when you look at Grafana, it's a really nice open source project, and uh, but uh, it is not part of the CNCF and it is managed by uh, mainly a single company which decide what they want to do with their trademark, what they want to do with their software. And so uh, just like Prometheus is a multi-company project, uh, I think it is nice to see uh, open source alternative to uh, to that uh, visualization tool. And yeah, I, we have seen the rise of Persis recently. It is still early on, it is still work in progress. But once again, we are speaking about Chronosphere because they are partly sponsoring the project. Uh, and it's basically a visualization front end for at the start Prometheus, but it will expand to other backends as well. So uh, basically the idea is they want to uh, also address some of the um, issues of Grafana, for example, the uh, dashboards as code, all the GitOps story of Grafana, which is at the moment 
uh, not completely figured out yet. So they want to uh, start from a clean sheet and say, OK, how do we design a solution that enables native integration of GitHub that works well with Prometheus? And that is under uh, an open governance, so completely transparent and uh, managed by multiple companies and maybe at the end donated to the CNCF. Currently, it is under the Linux Foundation directly, but uh, who, who knows what the future will will be for uh, Percy. So I think it's really important to have some choice when you are using Prometheus that you can okay not only rely on one visualization solution, but that we can work with many of uh, many of them. And maybe even uh, make some sort of a. Uh, an agreed uh, open specification that uh, can enable moving between tools. I think that's one of the things uh, that was mentioned. I, I was exposed to uh, Persis primarily in the recent PromCon when I saw the talk. And uh, although it was a, a short one, uh, it, it got me intrigued. So I think uh, it looks like a lot of potential there and uh, definitely a project worth, uh, worth following up on. I, I think the, the, key, the key thing is that you should have the choice of the solution that you use. And it's also something that is always in my mind and has always been in the mind of the Prometheus maintainers that uh, we have, I think we have very, uh, we have never designed a feature specifically for uh, a visualization solution in particular. We have always tried to be agnostic to that and really try to avoid some kind of uh, caching mechanism that would be very specific, that kind of thing. So uh, we really try to keep an open API on Prometheus in the way that uh, if you want to integrate with it, you can just do it. And we now see that the API of Prometheus itself is replicated in Thanos Cortex Mimir. They use the same API, which means that it is very flexible and it can break you a lot. And I think this is the power. That's why I said that uh, Prometheus, for me, goes beyond just a very successful tool, but also a, a de facto standard in many ways because of this approach that turned the Prometheus uh, APIs to some sort of a specification that, that others can. So you don't need to have Prometheus per se. You can have, work with other open source projects or even closed source uh, alternatives as long as they provide the same uh, API support, obviously the query language support. Uh, and uh, I think another very successful uh, example that emerged from the Prometheus community is uh, open metrics the exposition format that uh, spun out to its own standalone open source project under the CNCF that standardizes on the way to expose metrics, irrespective of Prometheus. Obviously, Prometheus is a big consumer of that, but uh, it's, it's now no longer just with the focus of Prometheus in mind, right? So you need to remember that in the world that we live today, every company is a software company, right? Everyone is running software. Everyone is doing any kind of development. Uh, uh, anyone is relying on those stuff. And if we can bring the same pattern, if we can bring useful pattern, useful way to uh, use your data to monitor your infrastructure, whether it is with Prometheus or other open source solution, it is a win for everyone because everyone is it. And even if Prometheus, we have thousands of users there are still many, many more that are not using any monitoring at all at the moment or very like bad monitoring from the 90s. And if we can bring those patterns to the user, no, whatever the project, uh, it's a win for everyone. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and another very important element in the Prometheus stack is the alert manager uh, that provides obviously the, the alerting function on top of uh, Prometheus. Can you give us a bit of a background on this, uh, on this, on the alert manager, its uses and, and where it currently stands? So the alert manager is a, a core project of Prometheus and it is the part that will actually make sure that you know about the alerts. So it is the part that will knock to your door and say, oh, you know, you have a server that's down. And it can talk to you via, it cannot actually knock on your door unless you write uh, what to do that, but it can. IoT, if you have IoT, if you have your home, home IoT. <laughs> it, it, it can uh, use uh, Slack, PagerDuty, uh, VictorOps, and a lot of different integrations. And uh, we try to bring more of those integrations natively, like the three last integration that we have added where uh, we had it Telegram, Discord, and now we are adding support for WebEx, Cisco WebEx, which is uh, not, uh, uh, used by a uh, let manager user. They want to get rid of their uh, third party integration to be natively integrated into the app manager. So it's really nice to see that we are uh, now 
integrating all those new receivers directly into uh, the alert manager. We are also adding support for time-based muting for receivers. So if you have an on-call team, that they only need to receive alert overnight. You can also do that natively in the alert manager now. And we're also adding a quality of life improvement with a negative matchers when uh, you can apply a negative matchers. So instead of saying, I want those labels to go to that receiver, you say, okay, everything that's not dev goes to the on-call team. Sounds good. So Alert Manager is getting a new release this week, actually. So at the same time, we're also working on memory usage. So this, if you have a really short repeat interval, like heartbeat alerts, for example, um, the upgrade of this week will also bring you a significant memory reduction if you are using Alert Manager. So we are also working very hard on the Alert Manager itself to make it more useful and also adapt to what users are actually doing with it. Sounds great. I want to say a word maybe about exporters as well, uh, if you want to share and yeah, the new Windows exporter and, and others. But let's first maybe get a bit of background about exporters in general, and then we talk about the new uh, new additions. Yeah, so one of the strengths of Prometheus is that uh, it works with plain text. Uh, so you can use curl in your uh, local browser and see the list of metrics. And any software that can expose an HTTP endpoint can expose metrics. We have not done that for MySQL yet. So MySQL cannot expose metrics natively. So in some cases, you need a small piece of software that can, in one side, talk to your software and on the other side, talk to Prometheus. So that's what is called an exporter. And uh, it's also the case for operating system. For example, the Linux system uh, did have an HTTP server in Linux 2.4, but that's long time gone. And it could not expose Prometheus metrics anyway. But um, so you need those kind of exporter to be like uh, very knowledgeable about the business. And on the other side, convert that to Prometheus metrics that you can query later. Uh, in the exporter world, we have a pro community, community project when people can share their exporters and then it will be taken off by the community. And uh, instead of being under one single user uh, GitHub namespace, we put them on the community, community GitHub page. If, the, if there is a need for maintainers, for example, it's a common place for the exporters. One of the most popular exporters that we have here is the Windows exporter. So uh, it, it has gone to a long journey from WMI exporter to now Windows exporter. It can actually do more than Windows because it can monitor your MSSQL, for example, uh, uh, that is running on Windows. So it's really an exporter. If you have Windows machine, Windows services, have a look at the exporter. That exporter uh, has been worked on by a large community of uh, users, and we are working towards making it an official exporter. So it will be completely under the Prometheus governance. Uh, so it will be better aligned with the goal of uh, the Prometheus project. We will have uh, it will be easier to talk to the maintainers, and it will also be easy for the users because they will directly find it in the download page of Prometheus next to the exporter for Linux, which is the node exporter. They will directly have the Windows exporter available for them. Amazing, amazing. An, another exporter that we are improving is the MySQL exporter. We are bring, bringing multi-target uh, support for the MySQL exporter, which means that you will not need to run one single instance of the MySQL exporter for, for each database, but you will just be able to run one for 10 different databases if you want to. So that's also, again, with the maturity, with the maturity of the project, we can do those kind of quality of life improvement for the administrators that are using Prometheus. Sounds good. And again, it's, I think it's the mindset of uh, supporting production use cases. So the one that runs with a cluster with many databases and still want to use Prometheus, they need an easy way to aggregate. And this is a very useful one. I wanted to say uh, I propose supporting uh, production environments and maybe enterprise grade use cases. Uh, there's been a need for uh, long term support. And I think your, uh, you and your team uh, jumped into this uh, gap and, and uh, took charge of this. Uh, can you say a word about the long-term support? For yeah, so 
Like we have mentioned, uh, we released 2.40.0 with uh, native histograms, and then they have they are seven different patch releases in less than six weeks, right? Because the release was less than six weeks ago. So when you make that kind of breaking changes in the code, they touch a lot of different code paths. And even if you have a lot of tests in Prometheus, well, there is always uh, uh, with new features, new risks coming. And Prometheus is releasing every six weeks. And for many, so everyone is a software company, but not everyone is an agile company. So uh, upgrading every six weeks or every week is not that easy for everyone. So so we have decided to take a certain Prometheus release and to say, okay, instead of releasing every uh, six weeks, we will just like keep that release available for a year. So uh, it was six months, we have extended that to a year. So we have a LTS version of Prometheus that enterprises can use. And we are going to support it for one year completely. So they will get bug fixes and security fixes for a year. So you don't get all the shiny new features, but when you are in an enterprise anyway, uh, it's not always about the new feature, but more about the reliability and the risk that you take. So we are, uh, it is completely upstream. So we work with the community, we work with the maintainers. Uh, you don't have to pay to use it, of course. Uh, it's completely on the Prometheus website, but it's available for one year, completely uh, supported release of Prometheus. We will, if you want the new releases, you will still have to wait for a few months. Uh, and then you put another LTS release and then you will be able to jump from one LTS to the other uh, quite easily. So, even if I'm creating Prometheus is always, should always be like worry free, like it should be quite simple to upgrade, but still getting a LTS release is really helpful for those customers. They don't need all the shiny features. They need a working Prometheus all the time. Uh, so that's the target. And there are quite a few users that are using it already. So we are quite happy with the outcome with the uh, LTS release. And we, uh, we are working to bring a new LTS in the coming months. So it's really, it's really nice to see that coming with the maturity that we can also listen to the users like, what, upgrading every six weeks? Yeah, you know, in my company, it takes two months just to get a VM. So what are you talking to me about <laughs> changing a release? Yeah, it is important to remember that not uh, every everyone is the uh, cool child on the blog that uh, moves agile. There are large uh, organizations. We want these large organizations to feel comfortable using Prometheus and these uh, these uh, capabilities and, and support is, is uh, very important for them. So and really great to hear that. Even what, what I notice as a maintainer is that sometimes we have some uh, quite impressive bugs and they are only reported like one or two months after the release and you are like, oh, many people are eating that bug and just not speaking up in the GitHub issues, not telling us about it. So uh, yeah, it's really, there is a really long time before you publish a release and people actually use it in production. That's where the LTS also helps that we know that, okay, this is a quite stable release. We know all the bugs we have fixed. And hopefully if you if you cannot upgrade easily, just pick the LTS version, it will be uh, really best for you. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds uh, like some many many have dreamed about this for for some time. It's great to have that uh, as part of the upstream and uh, way to go to you to you and your team for actually uh, taking this. That's amazing. I want to uh, maybe in the uh, bit of time that is left uh, talk about an, another important part of the ecosystem around Prometheus, which is and you mentioned that a few times uh, over the the, the discussion. Thanos, Cortex, Mimi are sort of the ecosystem of of uh, long-term storage, let's call it, uh, that uh, that uh, provides sort of a backend, uh, scalable backend for Prometheus. Um, I think the original intent was that, or the original, let's say, constraint in a way, was that Prometheus by design is a single node. You, you mentioned the simplicity as a core uh, core uh, value in in the in the community. So uh, obviously, it has it had its limitations with uh, vertical scaling, and when people started uh, looking for solutions for horizontal scaling and, and clustering. Uh, this is the place where these solutions came to be. Uh, could you help us just understand a bit this this space and the players in this space? Yeah, so basically uh, you can scale Prometheus vertically. You, we have seen people actually scaling a lot. Like uh, we have, I've seen people with more than one terabyte of RAM from Prometheus with many millions of time series. Uh, but still, yeah, um, 
Prometheus, as, as I said, we are a monitoring solution. And if you introduce some kind of distributed system, it's a lot of new trade-offs you need to deal with. And it's a lot more complex. And so we, are, uh, we have the remote write protocol that can write to a lot of different backends. Some of them are based on databases. You have prompt scale that will uh, dump your data into PostgreSQL uh, storage uh, engine. You have Cortex, Mimir, and Thanos, they work in the Prometheus way of dealing with the data, which means that they will write the same blocks as Prometheus will write more or less, and they will use external solution to store it, like uh, S3 bucket, which takes a lot of uh, maintenance away, well, which makes it a lot less um, costful with regards to the storage that is needed, but it's a lot of trade-offs. And uh, inside of the CNCF, there used to be two major players there, so Cortex and Thanos, they are still there. Uh, but now there is uh, Mimir, which has been forked out, out of Cortex into uh, Grafana Labs uh, AGPL license and GitHub. So uh, yeah, the future is quite uh, interesting for the long-term uh, Solutions. Um, we are we are seeing lots of customers running Thanos, some customers running Mimir, uh, and we also have a few that are uh, running Cortex. So it's really interesting to see how all of that will evolve in the future because every solution out there has its kind of trade-off and it is designed for a certain public, and it's interesting to see what will happen in the future because as a do as in this case, Prometheus is actually the downstream project, and we are just like seeing what's going on in the ecosystem, and we just try to work the best as best as we can to the other players. Um, so it's interesting that we to see the evolution that will come out of that. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned uh, the community. Then I think it's important to mention for our audience the different uh, places: the Slack, GitHub, events, IRC. Do you want to mention where people can uh, join the conversation around Prometheus? Yeah, if you want to join the conversation, you can go to prometheus.io/community. You have all the information uh, to the Slack, the IRC channel. Uh, we have some events, so if you go to promcon.io, you have the conference as well. And if you need help on Prometheus, you can join the mailing list or uh, the um, discourse, uh, the forum that we have. So just find us, discuss with us. We are al always open to the discussion. Also, importantly, uh, we if you are interested in the development, we also have developer summits, which are completely open and online. So you can also join the conversation there. We really want to expand Prometheus also the team and the community to uh, more diversity, more people, more voices. That's very important to us to know exactly how we can improve the project and stay relevant. Because it's not like I want to live in my own bubble, but we really want to expand and to welcome everyone. Yeah. And, so and, Prometheus uh, at io slash discuss. Yeah, that's that's a great source. Uh, and also I, I highly community. recommend uh, I highly recommend the uh, Promcon, uh, the one that was uh, in, in Munich in, in Germany was excellent. And also around the KubeCon, we had the Prometheus Day on the KubeCon North America. We'll need to see the format for the next KubeCon North America. Maybe it will unite with, with some others uh, around observability. But generally speaking, if you are in one of these conferences, an excellent opportunity to see people also face to face if you are there in person. And, and get the, the vibe of the community, a very vibrant community and, and uh, lots of things going on. Um, also, maybe, uh, uh, you, uh, Julian, if you want to mention how people can reach out to you after the show. Yeah, so you can reach out to me uh, at rwadlapri uh, at o11y.eu. So uh, you can also uh, find me on different social medias or on GitHub. So uh, you can also check on my company, uh, o11y.eu. So I think there will be also a link somewhere in the description where you can just uh, find find us if you need to, to have some uh, Prometheus support, we can help you with that. Yeah, so uh, we, we ran out of time. I actually decided to skip the uh, breaking news for this episode because we had so many interesting things to cover with you on the chat that I didn't want to waste any of the time. So uh, uh, apologies for our listeners, but I'm, I'm sure it was worth the while. And uh, uh, I also uh, will add uh, for the show notes the PromCon uh, EU uh, 2022 talk that uh, uh, Julien uh, provided. I'm also uh, putting it here on the... Uh, for the YouTube and Twitch uh, audience. 
Uh, so it will be also on the show notes and the other references that will help you get going with both the updates that we mentioned briefly and also on, uh, on uh, getting in touch with the community and getting involved because it is an amazing community. Uh, Julien, thank you very, very much for uh, joining me on this episode. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. I already wish you the best for next year and for the new year. So thank you, Dota, for uh, welcoming in the uh, in the show. Thank you very much. We need to uh, do more about uh, Prometheus, not wait so long uh, before the next update. So I'll definitely uh, keep in touch and uh, make sure that we cover that more adequately. And uh, with that, I'd like to also thank uh, our uh, listeners uh, for joining our episode. Uh, as always, all the episodes are available on, the fav on your favorite podcast apps and also on YouTube. So uh, do check it out if you're here on the live stream. And if you're not on the live stream, if you are listening on the podcast, uh, then do know that we stream the episodes live on Twitch and YouTube live. So uh, find all the details uh, on, uh, on our Twitter page at Open Observe uh, for when the live streams occur or follow me at Horvitz, H-O-R-O-V-I-T-S. And obviously also share your comments, your suggestions, especially for the new year, for the 2023, if you have any suggestions and things that you would like to see. Uh, or if you have something that you uh, would like to uh, talk about that you're a subject matter expert in and you uh, can share with the community, whichever, feel free to reach out uh, in whichever way. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm Dotan Horvitz and see you next month on the 2023 first episode of the year. Thank you very much, everyone.